another massive change in sport. It's been a change between sports venues and urban architecture and architecture itself. Just to keep everybody fresh, here are some examples of what was or what uh, still is. We've got uh, Three Rivers on the left, and of course we've got the home of the Tampa Bay Rays on the right. Some other notable, uh, unexciting examples, the Red Bull Place in Edmonton and uh, the Nassau Coliseum, which is about to undergo its own renovation. We've got four people that I'm going to have a conversation with who have literally changed the face of sport in a, in a very different dimension. If there is a, another woman who gets inducted in the uh, Hall of Fame, who comes down, it's Anna Marie Smith. Uh, some of you may not recognize the name. Uh, as well as some of the other stars. But you can see the, her fingerprint across the entire landscape of professional sports. That was the home of the Baltimore Orioles. That was Janet Marie's uh, vision, and which has changed sport. Of course, that's Oriole Park and uh, Camden Yards. In a city that uh, treasures its legacy of architecture, Jeff Wilpon, most of you know as, a, as the head of the, uh, of the New York Mets, more importantly, it's changing what was Shea Stadium. Uh, certainly was pretty, uh, if, if, if uninspiring, to a, an extraordinary sh architectural showcase. And we'll talk a little bit about that in that city field. If we talk of one of my favorite visionaries in sport, and he, he's done, uh, his fingerprints are, are on lots of venues across the globe. Matt Rossetti from the firm of the same name, Rossetti. I picked two of my favorites. Uh, he has an entire uh, portfolio of projects that, that, that he has done. For those uh, from Michigan, of course, that is the facility that's in a small market. That's the home in Grand Rapids of the hockey team. And near and dear to our hearts, uh, his, one of his most extraordinary accomplishments was the, the renovation of uh, Yost Arena and a view from the inside there. If there is one project that it may well become the most important relationship between a team and a city, it is what Tom Wilson and, as, as I've talked about, a lot of his friends are going to do about picking up um, a, a large section of downtown Detroit, and we're going to uh, put it on their shoulders uh, to rebuild. So that's who our panel is, and I want to start just with a conversation uh, 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 between everybody. Uh, I've got some questions that I'm going to pose. I'm going to start first with Janet Marie. Janet Marie, one of the things that the students I think are going to be most excited about was a few decades ago, you were a uh, struggling uh, architect, urban designer, sent a letter to Larry Lucchino, and it literally revolutionized baseball. How did you knock on the door and change, change the sport? Well, this is one of my favorite personal stories, so forgive me for the personal perspective. Um, but I had graduated from architecture school. I'd gotten a degree in um, urban planning. I'd worked on a big project in New York, Battery Park City, and I'd moved to Los Angeles and was working on the renovation of a park there. And I was eager to get back to the East Coast. I wasn't quite 30. I felt like I had one more professional fling in me before I, quote, settled down, whatever that might have meant. And I was really looking for a project more than I was a job, if you understand the distinction. I just wanted some, some other urban thing to work on. And I was a baseball fan, and I had followed with interest the Orioles' desire to move out of this um, funky little neighborhood park on 33rd Street in Baltimore um, and move downtown. And I'd followed enough urban revitalization stories in America to know about the Inner Harbor's development in Baltimore, and I was intrigued by the idea of a baseball team moving to downtown. So I wrote a letter to the president and um, described my background and said I'd love to work on this project, thinking what a great thing it would be to make it a true urban building, not just coexisting in downtown, not just taking advantage of sort of the lull in the market and the state's ability to acquire this piece of land, but really make it an urban park. And the irony of it is that um, I got the job because I wasn't in sports. Uh, Larry Lucchino desperately wanted to do something different. He wanted uh, Camden Yards, as we now know it, to be more like the old parks of Fenway, of Wrigley, um, of Ebbets Field. Um, and he was concerned that because he had a very well-known sports architect in HOK designing it, that he'd wind up with a beautiful project 
that had everything that you needed on the checklist, but without the personality that had shaped these parks. So it's still one of my better stories. I've worked for Larry twice now. Um, and uh, it's a lesson, I think, uh, to me, I still try to think about this all the time, to stay fresh and not get so deeply engrossed in sort of one box that you can't see outside that box, because it was the fact that I'd come from a different world that gave me the opportunity to work in sports in the first place. When you went forward with the idea of what, what we all know is Camden Yards, and, and Oriel Park at Camden Yards, there must have been some doubters. I mean, you were really going to change the cookie box. Yeah, there were a lot of people in Maryland, um, particularly. I mean, we, we weren't on the national scene. We were trying to do something good locally, and it ended up being a good national model. But that's, uh, that's, that's in hindsight. And at the time, there were a lot of people in Maryland who said, why are we going to use good new money to build a, quote, old park? Our, uh, Larry Lucchino's mantra was that we were building an old-fashioned ballpark with modern amenities, a moniker, by the way, that had been applied to New Comiskey, um, but uh, that maybe didn't resonate as, as well. And to be sure, the stars were really aligned for this project. The state, uh, the governor of the state of Maryland at the time was the former mayor, William Donald Schaefer, who just loved the city, just loved Baltimore. And he famously said after this Price Waterhouse study to look at many different locations throughout the state, citing the Orioles in the best possible location, he said, I don't care what the study says, as long as it says Baltimore. Uh, so th between the governor's passion for the city and Larry Lucchino's uh, interest and, and passion for this older uh, baseball-only park, things were really set up so that the stage was there for the, those of us who had a chance to work on it, to turn it into something. Jeff, you're in a city that prides itself on architecture. Uh, there are those who will argue that New York has the most varied urban architecture of any city in the world. You were coming from a ballpark that was dear to some fa fans, but certainly was not a compliment. Talk about a little bit about the process of, of building something that complements the architecture of the city of New York. Well, you're being kind to Shea Stadium, but uh, I appreciate that. <laughs> a anybody who remembers Shea, and, and there's lots of people who still love Shea and have fond, very fond memories of it. But what we wanted to do with City Field was sort of bring some of the things Janet Marie was able to do in a number of her projects and, and other ball clubs were able to do with their new stadiums. Um, and the, the main components of it were the bridge architecture that you see. New York City is a you know, Manhattan's an island, and to get on and off of it, you can, you can take some tunnels, but mainly you use the bridges. And the structure that we used, and, and a lot of the architecture with the bridge uh, motif was something that was very important to us. And then the archways. The archways came from Ebbets Field, which was very dear to my dad, uh, having grown up a Brooklyn Dodger fan and going to Ebbets Field and remembering the rotunda pulling all that together and trying to meld it into a new ballpark with all the new amenities that you see around the country. Uh, you know, big wide concourses, abundant bathrooms, great fan amenities. Um, you know, that was, that was the trick that we tried to pull off and, and do. And I think, you know, for the most part, we brought the project in on time, under budget, had enough money to go back and make some changes uh, the following year for some of the things we might have missed. And that turned out to be a great, great benefit to us. I want to get back to that key point, because a lot of times when you'll hear cities uh, and, and you'll hear some clubs talk about it, they worry about the envelope of the architecture being too expensive. But I just, there were two things that you said. One is you brought it in under budget you, and, and made an extraordinary contribution to, to uh, the city's architecture. What did you do inside to enhance the revenue to essentially make the project viable and architecturally significant? Well, unfortunately, the team hasn't performed like we'd, we'd like to bring 100% of the fans into the ballpark and have a filled venue all the time. But we built it in keeping with wanting to have a full venue and wanting to make sure that when you do have a full house, everybody can have a bathroom to use, everybody can have a concession stand nearby, you can have the ingress, egress work well when you have a full house, not just when it's playing to, you know, partially full house. And the revenue that we can generate from this building was tantamount to, to building it 
and wanting to put in place something that we knew could sustain a, lot, a long time uh, run here. So you know, the, the wide concourses, the things that other ballparks did, uh, where you can see into the ballpark from a 360 view around the main concourse, uh, the ability to go to a bathroom where you don't have to walk you know, halfway around the building, renumbering the, the stadium, okay, in terms of sections and, and making it intuitive of where you're going and how to get from one place to another, allowing fans from the, what we call our promenade, which is you know, the upper deck, come down and walk on the field level and, and congregate and have places for standing room. Even though we don't sell that much standing room, we have places where everybody can stand on the concourse, watch the game, go to Shake Shack, go to, the, go to some of the food uh, venues that we brought in, which was very different and a lot of people have copied now. So although we copied a lot of people going in, I think a lot of people have looked to us and, and tried to do some of the things we've done in their new ballparks. Matt, you've, you've designed uh, stadiums, you've designed ballparks, uh, soccer venues, tennis centers. I was going through the, um, your portfolio by the way, if you ever get to Matt Rossetti's office, he has the best collection of sports jerseys that anyone has ever had, since every team that you've worked for um, <laughs> is had. A couple of questions that sort of help, help the student understand it. One, how do you get the vision? How do you keep it fresh? What's the Rossetti philosophy? You've got, what, 55 people now engaged in this kind of process with you at, at Rossetti? 75. 75. Plus. plus. You've got you to come by more often. How, how do you do it? Uh, what do you do? Well, there's, there's kind of two things. Um, there's a methodology that, that, that we employ, and, and we refer to it as, as return on design. It's a, it's a different perspective that, that frankly, goes beyond um, what a lot of architects do, which is uh, functional and aesthetic. So. Can you make it work? Can you make it pretty? And, and those, are, those are pretty basic things, but going to beyond that to understand what, what's the value proposition? What's the deep secret or deep vision within each of these projects? And, and if you look at these two, what we were just talking about, I mean, we, that, that was a fundamental shift. What Janet was involved with was a fundamental shift in, in ballparks and the relationship between ballparks in, a, in an urban setting, right? They, they, I mean, that could have been another Comiskey. And you said, you know, check off the boxes, you got everything to work inside, but it had no relationship or would have had no relationship to the, to the outer field wall, to the city, to that, that fabric. And, and the kind of thing that now that, you know, we're gonna get to Tom's uh, eventually, um, we're gonna get to that project. And that, that, that is an even, you know, another layer, another step in, in, um, in how a, a sports stadium that used to be built out in the middle of a field of parking that now has this in complete engagement. Those are, those are big transformative um, issues that, that take a lot of understanding of where the, uh, where the sport is going, where the society is going in terms of, you know, now we relish urban life. We, we've left the suburbs behind and everybody wants to be part of the urban life. So it's all, it's all falling into place. Tom, t turning to you, uh, your career history is also uh, extraordinary in the sense that you go from a suburban venue, uh, amazingly successful, during, under your reign, uh, the palace was generating an extraordinary amount of revenue, but it's the antithesis of what Janet Marie designed and, of course, the great architecture that Jeff represents. And now you're on a project which, simply put, will put the entire city of Detroit on your back. Uh, it's an arena, but it's not an arena, it's five neighborhoods and, as we'll disclose in time, uh, several hundred acres. No one's ever done anything on the scale. What are you going to do? I'm a little scared now. <laughs> it's an intimidating question. I, I, and just to go back, Mark, uh, I just want to uh, uh, throw a few kudos. You asked uh, Matt about his philosophy, and when we built the palace, it was with Matt's company, a lot of the people who were still there, his father, Gino, who was uh, actively involved, and, and so audacious as possible. When the palace was built in 88, um, more suites, most expensive building ever built at, at the time, uh, and certainly privately funded, more suites than anybody had ever tried before, highest price uh, ever in the country, 
in Detroit, Michigan. I mean, the whole idea was fairly preposterous, um, but it was a building that, that changed an industry. And so I think as we look at, uh, at this project, uh, if we can pull it off, and I think we will, it's going to change the way I think arenas are constructed and designed, the way they fit in neighborhoods, and the impact they can have on a city. And there's always somebody that's willing to do a study about how arenas or stadiums don't really impact the, uh, the economies and, and quality of life in, um, in cities. And I think if it's done right, um, and with a lot of forethought, that they, they absolutely do. They're, they're uh, transformative in their nature. So this is a very audacious program. I mean, we're doing 45 blocks of renewal, and somebody said, if you can imagine that Grand Rapids is 46 blocks. Uh, you're really building a city within a city. And it started off as a project that was just going to be an arena. And I really give Chris Illich a lot of credit for saying, we just don't want another arena. You would have been on Woodward Avenue with a 150-foot tall building, and it could have been Staples, or it could have been United Center. Great building. But the scale doesn't work if you're hoping to build a city, and you're hoping to be part of a city. So really what we did is we deconstructed the building, and that meant take out all your sort of non-essentials. Let's take out the offices and take out the box office take out the restaurant, take out the merch store, the building sort of drops in scale, and you take all those other components and you put those on Woodward in sort of three or four story buildings and set back the arena, and suddenly you have the beginnings of a neighborhood that you've constructed yourself. And, and I think what we're doing is sort of looking at what everybody else has done. You look at LA Live, and they built Staples, and then a couple years later, here comes Nokia Theater and a bunch of restaurants, and a couple years later, there's the Marriott and the Ritz-Carlton, and, and you look at Orlando, and they're trying to do the same thing with an entertainment center. And we're sort of saying it'll have the greater impact, and maybe its greatest impact, if we do it from the beginning. And it'll change the experience of going to a game because in those outbuildings, it's a lot of retail and a lot of restaurants. So instead of saying, come on down to the new arena, I'll meet you at the restaurant, I'll meet you at one of 10 restaurants uh, that you have around there. And by expanding the neighborhood and expanding the scope and the scale of the project to 45 blocks, as crazy as it seems, you're sort of controlling the environment and you're rebuilding an environment. And, and people, because we have the baseball stadium there, the Fox Theater there, the football stadium there, a casino that draws six million people a year, um, parking is gonna be at a premium and we want people to feel safe and comfortable if they have to park four or five blocks away. And that's one of the beauties as opposed to building in the suburbs, which we did before, where you had all your parking contained around the building. Um, people don't walk and all the life is in the building. And that's, that's certainly one theory and we had a lot of great success with that theory, but if you want to build a downtown and you want to see neighborhoods thrive, you have to have people walking by it. And the fact that we're doing this in a, in a bankrupt city is, uh, is pretty audacious and pretty impressive, but I also have to throw kudos at another sports uh, figure, Dan Gilbert. And Dan went into Detroit uh, when people told him he was crazy, and he's bought 50 um, buildings. Uh, he went downtown and he said they had a sale on skyscrapers uh, and he ended up buying 50 of them and he has redone them all and they're all 80 to 100 percent leased and that generated, and Matt did a lot of the designs for that, that generated so much momentum in the city that when the Illiches were sitting out saying let's build an arena, I think the, the energy of what was happening in downtown Detroit, the sort of rebirth of the city, was an impetus to saying let's think bigger. And the reality is in Detroit, for years, and, and Matt's been a part of that as well, this is a little Matt stroke job here, um, but you know, one guy builds a loft, and one guy opens up a Dairy Queen, and one guy builds a little office plaza or something like that, and you had all these little things going on, but there was no connectivity, and nothing that created a, a sort of magic and a desire and a, and a magnetism to come down to that city. Well, now you see people down there, and now you see something of this kind of scale, and as a result, and by being as bold as the Illiches are being, we're getting calls from REITs all over the country saying, can I be involved? I, you know, I think one of the things we've had in Detroit is we've been beaten down. I mean, we've really sort of bottomed out, but when, when national publications put reporters here to spend a year to talk about how bad things are, I mean, you've kind of hit bottom. Um, the one thing in this country is people love a comeback. And it's a great story, and it's going to be fun to be part of this story. And, um, and I think in three years, it's going to be a pretty startling transformation. In five years, you're going to be amazed by what happens in Detroit. So if Dan showed up and they said they were having a sale on um, skyscrapers, I guess when Chris showed up, they were having a, a sale on vacant land and dilapidated 
Wasn't much of a sale, though. It was <laughs> a lot of, lot of money has been invested in that, a lot of time. Um, but I give Chris credit because, again, we could have built a, a, a normal arena and done very, very well. But it's that commitment to the city. And I remember even back when, when he was talking to me about coming down from the palace. Um, and I'm a Detroiter. I started out with the Lakers a million years ago. But I'm a Detroiter and uh, have been there virtually my whole life. And he said, don't you want to think about a time when you're taking your grandkids down Woodward Avenue and you can say, I had a little bit to do with that. And it's a pretty magical appeal for people in Detroit and in suburban Detroit and everything like that to see a city come back from the dead. You know, for you, and Jeff, for you, as Mike Tarika was talking about, your primary concern are your fans. But what you and your dad did was to say that you were going to tie into the legacy of New York, you're going to preserve that legacy, extend it in a modern sense. Tom, what you're saying is that you're going to take a city that lost about a million residents and uh, we're going to renovate it. Can you talk a little bit about how does that tie into the fan base? You've got an extraordinarily uh, successful team that's gone on for it. Jeff, you're competing in a, in a very comp competitive market. How do you balance the legacy to the city, the architecture, what you're taking on as a, a social mission, and then the relationship with the fan base? Well, for us, it's a little bit of a public trust that we run, and we run the team for the fans. We realize, you know, when we don't do well and there's anger out there, that's, that's a good thing to have anger versus apathy. So uh, I think what we tried to do is bring back some of the old Brooklyn Dodger fans and some of the people who became Met fans because they were originally Dodger fans and then the Dodgers left. Sorry, Janet Marie. But I didn't have anything to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> For those who don't know, Janet Marie uh, now is uh, the Vice President of Development for the Los Angeles Dodgers of Brooklyn. Right. <laughs> for those of you who can go back 55 years. So giving them a place that they can call home and they feel comfortable at was, was very important to us. And, and you know, again, it's, it is a public trust. It's something that we're running for the fans. We want to win as much as anybody else, uh, maybe more. But uh, we need those fans to come and help with the revenue we generate from them being at the ballpark and enjoying their time there, you know, spending some money using the restaurants and, and uh, concessions and buying merchandise, as, as somebody said before, the, the sweaters and uh, stuff. So we're going to get you a, a Mets jersey in your office too, Matt. I'm looking for that laundry. Yeah, that was a nice term. Yeah. So, so, so Tom, you've got hockey operations you've got to worry about. You've got uh, an extraordinary record of 20-odd years in, in the playoffs. That's the core that makes that brand real. And now you're going to throw the entire city on the back of you. How, how do you keep focused on both? Well, I think uh, the, the biggest emphasis we've had in the arena is, is making the hockey experience great. And what do you mean by that is we bring in the general manager and we say, OK, if there's one building you have to pick out in the country to say it's the most intimidating building. Where do you least like to play? Um, and they came back and said it's Montreal because Montreal is steep and they are right on you and they're rabid and there's no real open spaces. So it's just people everywhere you look, angry people. Uh, usually when you <laughs> skate out, angry French people. Speaking French. Uh, and, oh, uh, mais oui. uh, and, um, and so the general manager said, you know, he said, I'm intimidated. I'm sitting in the press box and I'm intimidated. But I know the players are, you know, sticks are shaking a little bit. Um, so how do we capture that feeling? And so we've really looked into making this as steep a bowl uh, as it can possibly be um, and still be totally safe. And the beauty of that is uh, the it brings you closer to the ice with overhangs and things like that. So you feel part of the experience. But that also translates to uh, concerts and, and other shows because you are going to be on top of that. And then you augment it with, with, um, with technology, which we have almost none of at the Joe. And then the other thing we have to look at as we, as we move down the sort of evolutionary path is at some point, you know, we won't sell out. I think we're at 150 sellouts in a row now in the 23 years. At some point, it won't be like that. But you have to look at the experience of the fan, which I think all of us are concerned about, is you know, how do we get them off the sofa and bring them down? And that's something we didn't deal with. 10 years ago, but now we're all so well aware of that. And that's where having 10 restaurant choices and, and meeting places outside and, and a, an atrium or a concourse, it's actually an atrium open to the sky. I mean, the feeling, the experience is going to be completely different there. So if we can hang on to the things that are important at Joe Louis Arena, and Joe Louis Arena is sort of the Fenway or the Wrigley Field of, of hockey, um, and it's surprising how many season ticket holders are saying, how can you leave? 
And it's, it's really tired and it's, it's a little bit worn out, but this is where I saw Iserman score that goal. And this is where I saw Chelios carry the cup around the ice and everything like that. And people don't want to let go of that at any of our ballparks. But you move on and you find out after about you know, three hours, this is so much better. So that's our job is to, is to capture uh, the glory and the memories of the past to the degree that we can and then sort of reinvent the experience if we can. To, to Matt and Jenna Marie, you both talked a little bit. Let's say, Jenna Marie, your background. So Oriole Park, uh, uh, joining with, with the effort touching uh, Petco Park in San Diego, uh, on to Fenway Park and re renovating it, and then um, the renovation uh, of, of Dodger Stadium, all the work in Atlanta. Each one of them, and let me finish the question because I'd like both of you to respond to it. All of these are different cultural experiences that those communities wanted in their ballpark, and you spoke a little bit about what, what the governor wanted. Matt, you're doing it in so many different cities, in so many parts of the world. What's the training you want to impart that students have about understanding culture, architecture, and revenue? Because you've, you've, you've done it, both of you, in, in different sort of settings. Culture, revenue, and architecture. Well, I think what's interesting about cities and sports is they've always been good bedfellows. And if you look back to the 60s and the Three River Stadiums and those buildings that we love to hate, they were used as a tool to wipe out urban blight. However you define urban blight and for what, whatever you might say about that period of America's history and our attitude about cities, sports were used as the vehicle for that change. So it's interesting and exciting to me that this generation, sports are being used to knit cities back together and to redefine cities. And what I think is wonderful about that and the opportunities that exist for those of you who care about that angle of sports is that whether you come into it from an economic lens, a political, uh, an economic avenue, a political avenue, a social avenue, um, a, a community relations avenue, that there's so many things that pull our cities and the sports together that one becomes almost a euphemism for the other. And that's certainly what I've enjoyed about it, is that um, people often uh, say, well, gee, you must love working in sports, and that makes for easy cocktail conversation. But I still think of myself as a black sheep in the sports world. I still think of myself as coming into it from an urban planner and architect's perspective and looking at it as what it does to a city, what does it does to a community psychic, both the physical development of it and also just the social development of it, um, the notion that more is more never applied better to anything in real estate. Why are gas stations on four corners? All four corners, a shoe store is so congregated at one end of a mall. It's the same reason that you want to put the arena right next to the ballpark and the Fox Theater and what synergy that will bring and how nice it will be for all of those things that happen around it, whether it's um, residential, office, or retail, or parking and transportation, to be able to serve all those uses at once. So. Um, I like, I like thinking about it because there's so many different ways to get to the same place. And, and Matt, now flipping the question to you, and again, some of the students may not know. So you've designed facilities uh, for Qatar. You've designed facilities across Europe. Uh, you've done, d designed facilities in Korea. And you've designed facilities in Grand Rapids, Michigan. It's a little bit different cultural mix. You don't think they're, they're like, just like each other? Korea Grand and Rapids. Grand Rapids, I got. Okay. But the other ones are good, don't. <laughs> So, so you, you, you asked two questions, and, you, and I think that domestically you covered that perfectly, that this whole urbanization and, and how venues are going to integrate more with, with urban strategies is, is, is just going to be prolific in the U.S. But um, what's interesting is, is how we just completed a um, stadium in, in Stockholm, Sweden, and the interesting thing was we, we were brought in by the folks from AEG because we did a lot of work with them, and... They loved and feared AEG tremendously because they really wanted to introduce the North American model of, of revenue generation and that whole attitude towards how do we make a lot of money? How do we monetize this building to the hilt? Um, but at the same time, we're, we're Sweden. We have a very understated um, 
calculated sense of culture and sense of design. So before they were going to let us loose uh, as AEG's um, architect designers, before they were going to let us loose, like we were you know, bad kids tearing about this house, we had to spend, we literally spent six months being indoctrinated into the culture of what it means to be Swedish and how they behave. And the cultural differences were, were, were in some levels, were extraordinary. Um, I, you know, we think of ourselves as a semi-enlightened society in the U.S. With, with, with respect to male and female relationships. We're, you know, probably still a little chauvinistic, but there they have this phenomenal sense of, of, of equality. And, and what that means to the process, how that was part of the process and, and the discussion and what we, had, we went through in terms of the evolution of the building and, and the aspects of the building that became more important than just a bunch of guys beating their chest, you know, who could scream loudest at the table, um, was extraordinary. And the results were extraordinary. And you could see them uh, integrated throughout the aesthetics. Um, that, was, that was a really eye-opener. The other thing I find really interesting is the laws um, in most European cities still um, prohibit private ownership and private man management of venues. They still see venues, stadiums, stadiums and arenas as, as city or civic assets, and assets you know, that can be subsidized, so they don't necessarily need to be revenue generators. They don't have to stand on their own, like, like, like build it with the, with the palace. Um, so that, when you get into that attitude, that's, a, that, that's going down a, a slippery slope because then there's no expectation for things to be the best and, and to be striving that, that, that direction. So a lot of that is beginning to change. England um, is, um, is at the forefront of it. And it's interesting, the results, um, their venues are more like our venues. They are, they're, the whole way they watch the game and the viewing and the, uh, is changing the culture and the hooliganism is going down because when you, when you, when you present a, a higher quality venue, you remember Tom, we put in the, the, the fabric seats in the palace, the first arena to have fabric seats. And, and everybody said, you're, you're crazy. They're going to tear these things up. They're animals. They're, they're, they're going to burn them in concerts. N not a thing, right? Yeah. That first year, so you 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 uplift the environment and, and people behave better, and that's and that's what they're seeing. All of you have designed or, or been involved with, with venues that have sort of what I call the different sort of event window opportunities. Uh, and a lot of the students who suffer through the class with me. So if you have a football stadium, it's ten to twelve dates. Baseball, eighty-one. An arena, wow. Then you can go up to uh, one hundred seventy-five, one hundred eighty. Uh, some of the students don't realize, Tom actually works for the organization called Olympia Entertainment, of which there is Red Wings hockey, but there's a tremendous amount of entertainment. As you think through the relationship of these buildings to urban space, how do you reconcile the fact that you might have a, a venue that might be only used 10 times, as opposed to one 175 or 181, where at the best time of the year, you probably don't want to rip up the grass too much? How does it all fit together as you vision urban space? Well, we built our ballpark so that we can do other events, and we're doing about 250 to 275 additional events outside of baseball every year in a company we started called Metropolitan Hospitality. So, um, you know, like this year, a bunch of the tennis sponsors needed additional space. Uh, so during the tennis event over at Flushing Meadow, they rented space in our building for their hospitality. Nike, for one, took out uh, one of our clubs and used the club to have all their players and all the uh, athletes that they have under contract come to our building before they went over to the tennis center, get their gift bags, which they do pretty elaborate gift bags for these athletes at every event, and had a hospitality space for them and their, their friends and, and stuff pre, pre going over there. So, I mean, things like that end up happening. What we've tried to do, though, is go after large events. We haven't had as many concerts as we wanted because the windows that we get in terms of breaks during the season, again, you're tearing up the field, and you know, it's, it's trying to make that, that good call. Is it really going to sell out and you get the revenue from it that you want, or is it something that doesn't make a lot of sense? So we've had a harder time with that. The smaller events, renting out our parking lot, we're lucky enough that we control our entire parking lot, 8,500 spots. Uh, you know, 20 some odd acres, 
that is really good for car shows and different things, urban athlon type stuff, a uh, bunch of different concerts in the park. You've probably heard of like Electric Zoo and the Daisy Carnival has been there. So those things have been uh, very successful. Jeremy, we, we, when you touched Camden Yards uh, and, and its, its proximity to the Harbor Place, was it with a vision towards non-baseball events? Was that in the thinking? I think our primary goal at the time was to try and make sure that Camden Yards wasn't shuttered when there wasn't baseball. So our focus wasn't at, at the time so much bringing other events to Camden Yards as it was making certain that the things that could have a life that were in our program anyway, um, were positioned so they didn't shut down. So many of the things that Tom mentioned, the, the Orioles retail store, the restaurants, some of the concessions, the ticket office, even our own offices were all put in the warehouse on, that was on the side. And that was, um, you know, for those of you who know Oriole Park at Camden Yards, you know it's defined by a thousand foot long, hundred year old brick warehouse that was very controversial at the time. You know, why are you gonna say that old thing? What are you, it's gonna keep you from doing a very flexible ballpark. But we felt that it was ingenuous to go into an urban environment and say we wanted to be an urban building and start by tearing down the very thing on the site that gave it identity. So we made it work by putting those things in there. But because Jim Rouse had just completed the Inner Harbor in Baltimore some 10 or 15 years earlier, and it still felt new and fresh. Our real goal was to try and think about the public spaces and about the streetscape, and the, thus Utah Street was born uh, as a notion of extending the public, the public right of ways. As groundskeeping, I think it's fair to say, has gotten more sophisticated, just like ice making, I, I think baseball teams are no longer as concerned about bringing in other events on the field. Certainly the Orioles, like the Mets, have always used the other spaces, the club levels and the suites and the event spaces to host things that don't require the use of the field. But I think, I think even the field isn't as sacred as it used to be. Otherwise, we wouldn't be playing hockey at Dodger Stadium in uh, January, you know. So we're not as afraid to take the mound and the grass out and try and put it back in during a road trip as we used to be. Tom, for a lot of the people focused on the sports business, and you're certainly identified with the Detroit Red Wings, uh, but you're actually uh, Olympia enter Entertainment. And the arena is really for Olympia Entertainment. Just describe how that relationship about revenue, the building, and the team really fit fits together. Well, normally now, the, uh, the economics of sports are so difficult for every team, unless they have a, an enormous national television contract. You're fighting for every fan and every dollar that you can get. The entertainment side of the business is crucial uh, because they're people that come in and park the cars and, and go to your concession stands and keep everything moving. And more than anything, and the, the reason this project, I think, is, is going to be so exciting is the arena, an arena, unlike a baseball park and unlike a, a football stadium, gives you every conceivable demographic coming down every other night. Um, and it just fills in all the space. So you can have 10 football games, you can have 80 baseball games, you can have other things going on, 150 events at the theater. But this thing is going all the time and bringing constant traffic down. And so the, um, we always look at, at uh, the, the sports team's the most important person. Uh, the sports team was the most important thing at the palace when we were there. It's the most important thing in this new building. However, it's only a quarter of the events. And so as you enter into design, the biggest mistake I think you can make is just to be totally focused in on what that team needs to the exclusion of what the public needs because most of your people coming down to that experience are going to be coming for something other than the primary tenant. See, you've said something that's really important for a lot of the students to understand is that when you start thinking about the arena, you basically said only 25% of the attendees are actually gonna be there for a hockey event. Yeah. Or less, yeah. Or, or, or perhaps e even less, the arena might be more successful if you think about Madison Square Garden right. or Staples Center. Right. Even with three teams, they still have more non-sports events than they do have sports events. That's right. And that's been a real ba major change uh, in the industry. Yeah, and, that, and that's the focus because there, many times you can make more money on those events than you can uh, on a year of hockey, a year of basketball, even a year of baseball. Mm -hmm. Matt, when, when you go in now designing so many different venues, how do you think about that in the design aspects, about how it fits both the, the anchor tenant, which might be a sports team, but then the fact that you're going to try to get multiple other events. In Jeff's case, they're getting 275. Tom's looking at 175 for Olympia Entertainment. Um, 
You know, that's a good question. And what's interesting is, is what, what, what Tom has going on right now for the venue is, is actually going in a, in, a, in a different direction. And bulls over the time, I, I think John mentioned earlier about the, the <coughs> tribal instinct, the tribal mentality. So folks are, the whole fight between staying home and watching the, va the game, the event on TV, mm -hmm. or getting out, schlepping out to the, uh, to the event itself and, and, and putting up sometimes with the parking and the lines, et cetera. Why do you go there? You go there to, to experience it with other human beings, sometimes complete strangers, and you're high-fiving, and it's the whole part of that, that, that tribal scene, and that's why people go to those things. So the way design has, has, has taken that on lately is to integrate it into the bowl, open up the concourses. You, you see the bars in the corners, and, and now there, there's even there's new venues that have um, bars that where you can go to if you didn't get a ticket to that game. You can still get into the bar, watch the game through the glass, and oh, by the way, if you're you know kind of excited about it, you buy a ticket right then and there and, and, and walk on down. So the integration of the party scene, the the, the fun event, the social scene in the it, within the framework of the bowl is has been the direction over the last ten years, and there's some really interesting things happening and in, in, in how it's re. Uh, reinforming the, the the design of stadiums, arenas, etc., and 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 you're going almost in the opposite direction, closing it in mm -hmm. to focus on that intensity of hockey. So it'll be you know this is all fun experiments to see how these things are going to play out. We've only got five minutes, but one other question. One of the other innovations, Janet Marie, that you brought into sport was the notion of changing the ticket control point. Before that, students realize, mm -hmm. I grew up. You got admission to the ballpark and you walked in. But in Baltimore, ticket point is all the way out at Utah Street mm -hmm. to enter into it. You, you literally took the ballpark out into the city. And then, of course, you did that at, at, at uh, uh, in, in in Fenway Park. Yeah. Talk a little bit about that in terms of revenue aspects. And then, Tom, if you're going to reflect a little bit for, the, for so many of us here in, in the Detroit area, are you going to? change the control point uh, aspect. So with Janet Marie first. Well, our goal was very civic in nature. In spite of what it might look like from a financial perspective, it was very profitable for the Orioles. But it was a way of saying, we want these retail stores, these restaurants, that these things should have a life beyond baseball. So we want them to be part of the urban scene, fit into the urban fabric, be operable 52 weeks a year, but then during game time, we want them to be part of our concession environment so that we weren't investing twice in something. We were investing in something that would have a, a year-long life, but then it would serve as a de facto concession. And so it, it's funny, Utah Street in Baltimore and, um, and Yawkey Way in Boston are sort of cousins of each other. And uh, we created Utah Street because we looked to Boston. We thought, wow, we love the energy around Fenway Park. How can we capture that and make that, and make that happen here? Uh, it seems so organic outside of Fenway. And then years later, when um, I had a chance to work for Larry Lucchino, when he became president of the Red Sox, one of the first things we did was to go to the city of Boston and ask Mayor Menino, could we put turnstiles on Yawkey Way so that Yawkey Way would become a de facto Utah Street and all of those vendors would be inside the park and we would control them? And again, our goal in Boston wasn't really an egregious one about making more money. It was to say, look, our concourses are too small at Fenway Park to ever satisfy today's expectations and, our, and the norm that our fans have come to expect by virtue of experiencing other parks. And if we want to save Fenway, we've got to find some novel ways of saving Fenway as it is, but appending pieces to it that make it behave like the new parks. And um, our neighbors fortunately saw that as, it, as what it was, a way of saving Fenway. Uh, so that's been the fun part of me, as much as the way Tom described is, is taking the program of things that go into a sports venue and saying, well, what do you have to have just for the sport, and what can you have to make the whole of the city more, more lively? Tom, if you're talking about the district, and obviously this is a, a, at least a, a year or so out, but, but are you evaluating whether or not the, the control point on Red Wings days would be more in the district, or what's the 
current thinking today? Well, it'll be in the district, but it's going to be very much like what Janet's talking about, where you do pull it away, and, and this whole via or this concourse area we were talking about that is the sort of the, the arena on one side and all these buildings and shops and stores and restaurants on, on the other side covered with glass. Um, the whole idea is to have that open 24-7 so that people can come down there. We've got people coming in from Times Square to make the, the experience uh, pretty exciting and pretty memorable, even in that concourse area. So, you know, it gives people a, a lure to come down. And I said earlier about, you know, coming back from the dead, the city. The city's been alive and the city's been vibrant, but a lot of people in the national media were sort of piling the dirt on. There's a lot of people down there. They just needed some impetus to move down there, which Dan Gilbert has provided with jobs and everything like that. And now if we can build the epicenter of sports and entertainment down here and, and make that, um, that sort of circle of influence as big as it can possibly be, then you'll see the city really come down and come well, back. On, on behalf of the faculty, the students, uh, the MSBC, thank each of you for coming. I mean, you've each revolutionized sport in this extraordinary way and sharing your experience with the students. Thank you. Thank you very much. No problem. Good work.